Um, so my task this morning is not an enviable one. What I was tasked with doing was setting the scene for the whole of the remainder of the conference. And as I'll demonstrate in that talk, uh, that's, that's not an easy thing to do. What I want to do then in this talk is to show you uh, what AI is, the reality of AI. And AI is a broad church. And if there's one thing I want you to take away from this talk, is that AI is a very, very broad church. And part of that broad church is the headline achievements in artificial intelligence, which is why so many of you are here, because you've seen in the press uh, and, and uh, in, in the online media about the many remarkable achievements that AI has made over the last 10 years. And they are important, but they are part of a much bigger story. And the much bigger story is what I want to convey to you today about the world of AI. So we all know that AI is big news, but just how big is it? Here is one opinion. AI is bigger than electricity. So who said that? Was it Donald Trump? Was it Boris Johnson? No, it was Andrew Eng. Andrew Eng is a former head of research at Baidu, a head of the AI group at Stanford University, one of the world's historical leading centers for artificial intelligence. Uh, he's one of the founders of Coursera. So you should know what he's talking about. But some people think AI is even bigger. But AI is bigger than fire and electricity. Fire is pretty big, I think. Fire is the most fundamental of all our technologies, more fundamental even than the wheel. So who said this? Was it some crazy guy? No, Sundar Pinchai, CEO of Google. Somebody who, again, ought to know what they're talking about. Some people think that AI is even bigger. Uh, if you have a spare moment later, you might want to Google this name. There's lots of interesting stories attached to it. Uh, if you want to understand what's going on here, uh, this chap founded a religion, and it's the religion of artificial intelligence, and it's based on the premise that eventually AI will rule us anyway, so we should just get ready for that and start worshipping it now. Uh, if you really want to understand the motivation, in the United States, religions get tax breaks. So... So AI is big news, and there are many, many breathless stories in the press about artificial intelligence. And with such senior people making such bold statements, it can be quite hard sometimes to filter through all that and to try to understand what the real substance of AI is. And what are the things that we should be excited about, and what are the things that we should treat with a pinch of salt. So that's what I'm going to try and do in this talk. So... First, let's say a little bit about varieties of artificial intelligence. So we all imagine that we know a bit about AI. And why do we imagine that we know stuff about AI? Because we are exposed to ideas about AI in uh, the media, uh, in novels, in science fiction novels, in computer games, in movies and TV shows. And we're exposed to that all the time. And that plants in us this idea of what is called artificial general intelligence. So artificial general intelligence, AGI, or just general AI, this is the Hollywood version of AI. This is the dream of building machines that have the full range of intellectual abilities that human beings have. So anything a human being could do, an artificial general intelligence system, an AGI system, could do. And this makes for great movies and TV shows and books, but the reality is that's not where the action is. Um, so... Uh, this idea is associated with ideas like conscious machines and the singularity. You may have heard of the singularity. The idea that there will come this point at which machines will be smarter than people. And when they're smarter than people, then they can start to improve themselves. And it will all be beyond our control. There's many books been written about this idea of the singularity. And they're fascinating reading, but they're not where the reality of AI is today. And they're not where the reality of AI will be anytime soon. On this vision of artificial general intelligence, there's no progress. There's no real progress. There's very little serious activity. And it is extremely controversial within the AI community. And a large part of the AI community completely dismiss these ideas of artificial general intelligence. So on the one hand, that's kind of disappointing. We won't have robot butlers anytime soon. But on the other hand, it's kind of reassuring. You know, we won't have Terminator anytime soon. So what is the reality of AI today? Well, the press call the reality of AI today narrow AI. What is narrow AI concerned with? Narrow AI is concerned with extending the capabilities of what computers can do. 
getting computers to do things which currently require brains. Human brains or animal brains, but brains, nervous systems, and bodies. Okay? Now that sounds boring, but every time you can extend the range of what computers can do, there are new products and services to be offered. There are new things that you can do. There is money to be made. There are new, uh, uh, there are new uh, innovations that you can develop. And basically, all current AI research is focused around that. That's where all the progress has been. And we'll talk about that progress in the remainder of this talk. Um, and the truth is, we don't actually, within the AI community, call it narrow AI. So if you called it narrow AI, you would immediately single yourself out as somebody who's not part of that community. It's just AI. That is what AI is. Okay? So narrow AI, or just that AI, is concerned with getting machines to do things which currently require brains, and which standard computer development techniques don't offer us any solution. Okay? So um, let's have a look at some problems that we might think about getting computers to do for us, and these are roughly ordered from the top to the bottom by how hard it was to get computers to do them. And right at the top, we've got uh, right at the top, we've got um, arithmetic, uh, and arithmetic was the very first thing that people got computers to do. Back in the late 1940s, Alan Turing joined the lab at Manchester University, and the very first program he wrote was to do long division. Okay? Um, why is it easy to get computers to do arithmetic? Because there is a simple recipe for arithmetic that you were taught at school, even if you don't exactly remember the details of it now, and maybe not for long division anyway, right? And that, um, that recipe is very easy to give for, to a computer, and so that problem was solved very quickly. But as we start heading down, we start to encounter problems which, even though we think we can solve them in principle, like playing board games, turn out to be phenomenally hard. So take a board game like chess, there's actually a very simple way of playing chess, getting a computer to play chess. You just look at all the alternatives. I look at all the moves that are available to me, and then all the counter moves that my opponent can make, and all the counter moves that I can make. I find out the winning positions, and that's where I head for. Roughly speaking, that's a standard algorithm for chess. The problem is it just doesn't work. If you try and code that up, it's not a long process of coding it up, but it just won't work. Why won't it work? because it takes too much computer memory and far, far, far too much time. So it looks like we have a solution, but it just doesn't work. But in the second example, recognizing faces in a picture, I don't know what the algorithm would be for that. I don't know what the recipe would be. How do you write a computer program to recognize faces in a picture? It's not like chess where we have some ideas of some algorithms. We don't have a clue. Okay, so you need something else. But nevertheless, after lots of work, these two things are now solved. So board games is pretty much all the board games that people play, that ordinary people play, I should say, are basically solved. Computers are better at them than people are. Recognizing faces in pictures, computers are now better than people are at doing that. Now we move on to some things which are just on the threshold. Driverless cars, okay? Why is driving a car difficult? Okay, all the difficulty with driving a car is knowing where you are and what's around you. If you solve those two problems, the rest of it is easy. If you know there's an obstacle there and that you're traveling at 60 miles an hour towards it, the decision to apply your brakes is actually a trivial one. All of the difficult stuff there is to do with perception, understanding where you are and what's around you. And that turned out to be phenomenally difficult to get computers to do, okay? Interpreting spoken language for similar reasons turns out to be very, very difficult for computers reliably translating from one language to another. We have usable translation tools now, which are one of the crowning achievements of modern AI. Google Translate, that's an AI program used by millions of people across the world productively every day. It doesn't do perfect translations, it does usable translations, okay? And stepping towards reliable translation, rich translations, is much harder. Then towards the bottom, we're getting into the territory of kind of these artificial general intelligence things. Understanding a story and answering questions, inventing funny jokes, interpreting what's going on in a picture, writing interesting stories. Nobody has a clue. By the way, I should say, writing jokes, computer programs that write jokes, that's an active research area. But at the moment, the jokes aren't very funny, I have to tell you. Okay, so that's a work in progress. We're nowhere near these things at the bottom. Okay, so how do those are the, that's the kind of the territory, that's the roadmap of 
how AI has progressed from some relatively trivial things at the top down to some phenomenally hard things at the bottom. And at the moment, we're somewhere around about here. Okay, and it's worth remembering when Alan Turing programmed the Manchester baby in 1949 to do arithmetic, people thought that was an electronic brain. Uh, it was doing these huge amounts of arithmetic really quickly. And people thought that for them was AI. This thing must be phenomenally clever to be able to do that arithmetic very quickly. Okay, um, so how do we actually do it, right? How do we go about doing AI? And here there is a division in the community. For more or less 50 years, the dominant approach was the following. I'm calling it top-down. The idea is, suppose you want to build a program that can translate French text to English text, then what you need to do is to come up with all the rules that govern French and all the rules that govern English, all the rules that govern the syntax of French, the rules which define how you're allowed to structure French sentences, and then come up with rules which define the meaning of those sentences. We write all that stuff down and we give it to the computer. So in other words, you get a human expert to do all the work coming up with that human expertise, and you give it to the computer. Okay? That is the, sometimes called the knowledge-based approach. For 50 years, that was a dominant approach. And it had some successes, but with problems like perception, the driverless car problem, understanding what's around you, turned out to be really not much use at all. It didn't make really substantial progress in that area at all. So there's an alternative approach, which I call bottom up, which is instead of me trying to tell the machine all the rules that I have about French language and English language and how to do that translation, what I do is I show the machine the translations and somehow let it figure out how to do the translation itself. Okay, and I call this bottom up, sometimes called the data-driven approach, and this is where we've seen tremendous breakthroughs over the last 10 years. It's the area of uh, machine learning, or, 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 and in particular, deep learning, which has received huge press over the last few years. So let me tell you about one, uh, again, this Google it if you're interested in finding out the details, one experiment from the days of top-down AI. There was a researcher, a charismatic and brilliant researcher called Doug Leonard in the United States, and he became convinced that actually the key to general intelligence, the Hollywood dream, was that we had to give a machine everything a human being knows about its world. All the knowledge that a human being knows about its world, he said, we have to write that down and give it to the machine. And when we've done that, we will have solved the problem of general intelligence, the Hollywood dream, right? Robot butlers and all of that. So they had armies of people trying to come up with all the knowledge that a human being would use. Think about everything, all the pieces of knowledge that you use since you woke up this morning until you came to this lecture and switched off. Okay, <laughs> all of that knowledge. What would that knowledge be? Red taps produce hot water, the sky is blue, you can't eat Kansas. Cats are often pets, but not always. Everything an ordinary, educated human being knows about their world, whether they realize it or not, would have to be explicitly written down and given to the computer. And they had armies of people working on it. Um, well, the punchline, it didn't work. Um, uh, and it's not hard to see why it didn't work. It's quite interesting to read the literature on this. You discover that if you just miss one tiny connection, the whole thing falls apart. It was incredibly difficult to judge how well you had succeeded on this. And for that reason, because so much money and time was spent on this, and it was um, uh, uh, in its grand goal it was unsuccessful, although it did spin off into some successful products, and you can download their, their products and use them today, but in the general goal, it failed. And it's often cited as an example of the limitation of these top-down approaches. I give the machine all the expertise it has. So the alternative approaches are these bottom-up approaches. What we do instead is we simply show the machine what we want, and it figures out how to do it. And this is machine learning. So here, what I want my program to do is to recognize pictures of Alan Turing. That is, when I show it a picture of Alan Turing, I want it to produce the text Alan Turing. I want it to print out Alan Turing. And so how do I do that? I train it with lots of data. That's the other big lesson, of course, from modern AI. Lots of data is essential. Okay, so what we do with this program 
is we train it, we give it a picture, we label it with the name of the person in it, another picture labeled with the name, another picture labeled with the name, and then eventually, if we've succeeded, we give it a picture and it will be able to come out with that name on its own. And this is the area of machine learning. We're not telling it how to go from that picture to that text. That's the magic of machine learning. How does that magic work? Well, there are many different approaches, but one of the most successful and popular is neural networks. And neural networks um, are not attempts to build brains, it's not what we're doing, despite the name. That's not, we're not trying to build artificial brains. What we're doing is taking inspiration from the microstructure of the brain and the nervous system, where there are units that successfully learn, and we're trying to replicate those in software. So the basic idea here is we have a very simple and stylized neural network, and my colleagues in the audience who do neural networks are groaning because it's highly simplified and stylized. But the basic idea is we have these neural units in the middle, and each of these neural units is receiving inputs. Think of these inputs as being like the pixels on the pictures of Alan Turing, each of the colored dots on those pictures. And each neuron is looking at the inputs it gets. And if, the, if these inputs exceed certain weights, if it's getting a certain pattern of these inputs, then the neuron develops an output. And generally, what happens is these neural net units are arranged into layers. So this layer feeds into another layer, feeds into another layer. And usually there are many, many more of these neurons, thousands of these neurons with many layers. And so all of the work in a neural network is about finding how these connections work. And technically, each of these connections has a numeric weight on it. The whole of a neural network reduces to those numbers, to those weights. And training a neural network means adjusting those weights. As you see the inputs, the picture of Alan Turing, you adjust those weights until it produces the correct output. And you carry on doing that until it gets it right. Okay, and that's neural networks. So let me demonstrate to you, this is the point at which when I saw this demo, this is when I woke up to the fact that something exciting was happening in AI. So, okay, so here we've got uh, a program that was written by DeepMinds, 2013-14. And what they did is they took an Atari video game console, an 8-bit Atari video game console from the 1980s, and they wrote a program which learned to play all 49 of the games that that console offered. Okay, so here is one of the games. Some of you will recognize it. Okay, so the idea clearly in this game is that you are controlling that paddle at the bottom. You control it with a little joystick. And what you have to do is knock out all the bricks. And every time you knock out a brick, you get a point, essentially, okay? So the program just controls the joystick, okay? That's all it does, the same controls that we have. But here's the crucial thing. What their program sees is just that. It sees the video feed. It doesn't see anything else. It doesn't have any privileged information. Nobody tells it what the rules of the game are. When it starts out, it's got no idea how to get a score. It essentially just starts experimenting. When it gets a point, it tends to repeat that same thing again. And over time, its neural networks get trained until it becomes competent at this game. So at the beginning, it's pretty useless. Oops. At the beginning, it's pretty useless. It's continually missing the, uh, continually missing the ball. It doesn't know what to do. But then it, it gets a point, and it's got the feedback. It's got feedback, and that makes it more likely to do that again. There it gets another point, makes it more likely to do that again. After 200 training episodes, it's getting better. It's not perfect, it's still missing the ball, but it's getting better. Okay, still from time to time misses the ball. But after a while, after 400 training episodes, this is just playing it 400 times, it never misses. It's reliably, continually hitting that paddle and getting the point. So that's pretty impressive. You'll notice it's kind of going all over this. It's because nobody told it that actually it shouldn't do that. So it's irrelevant from its point of view, whether or not it gets a score. But then after a while, it did something completely remarkable. And this is what it discovered it had to do. <laughs> Nobody told it that. It's just, this is a program which has been trained to get the highest score as quickly as possible. And just by trial and error, by playing this game repeatedly, learning how to do that, it discovered that that's the most efficient way to get a score in that game. Now this is a 1980s, early 1980s, 
late 1970s video game. And the designers didn't have any idea that that behavior was there. So they were completely startled when they saw that behavior. Okay? Nobody told it the rules of the game. It discovered all of that on its own. Okay, so it's a huge achievement. I say it opened my eyes to the fact that there's something there in this, in this deep learning world. But, um, and the crucial thing is it only sees what you or I see. It doesn't have any other information. It doesn't have any kind of privileged information at all. But do you know what the score in life is? Right? It knows what the score is. It knows when it's just made a successful move. Do you know when you've just made a successful move in life? Not necessarily. And this, technically the credit assignment problem right, in, in machine learning, knowing which of your actions were the good ones is one of the really big problems. And on the games where, unlike Breakout, where you get a score much later on for something that you do now, their programs struggle. So that's uh, a big problem. Uh, and this program is just a little bit of code which is optimized to do one tiny thing very, very, very efficiently. Okay, it can't explain why it makes a move. Why did you drill down to the bottom? It doesn't know that, it can't answer that. It's just a big, long list of numbers. That is the difficulty of explanation. That's why people talk about explanation in machine learning, because all of that expertise just reduces to a big, long list of numbers. And we look at those and they mean nothing to us. And they literally mean nothing apart from in the context of that machine learning program. It can't transfer its expertise from one game to another or explain what it's done, generalize, apologize, or rationalize for what it's done. And those are key limitations. All right, why does it work? Why does this approach work now? Well, there are three things. There were some algorithmic breakthroughs around about 2004, 2005. And there are uh, colleagues at Oxford, the AYT in statistics, was one of the authors of the breakthrough deep learning papers. But then just as importantly, it was discovered you need lots and lots of training data and lots of compute power to be able to do that. So these were the magic ingredients that drove the deep learning revolution. These algorithmic breakthroughs, roughly the deep part of deep learning, lots of training data and lots of compute power. Okay. Okay, so let's just briefly talk about the limitations of these approaches. Let's just very briefly talk about the limitations of these approaches. So here's a dialogue, six words. Bob says, I'm leaving you, and Anne says, who is she? You all understand that dialogue, right? You all watch EastEnders, right? So every episode of EastEnders, that dialogue takes place. You all understand that. Now, if you plug that dialogue into Google Translate, you can translate it from English to French, from French to Spanish, Spanish to Arabic, Arabic to Russian, and Russian back to English, and you'll get those six words back. But at no point anywhere, does the system have that comprehension, that understanding of the dialogue, that rich mental picture, the ability to explain around that story that you all have? Why? Because that program doesn't have experience of the world as a human being that we all have. Okay, now I talked at the beginning about the difference between machine learning and AI. Machine learning is an incredibly successful and powerful technique is a component of AI, but it's not AI. AI would be about being able to understand and answer questions about that dialogue in that same way. But here's another quick one. Okay, so my question to you is what's going on in that picture? Just explain the picture. You all recognize this guy, right? Yeah? Okay, so what's he got in his hand? Yes. Some of you think it's tea, some of you think it's coffee. What's in his pocket? Script. Okay, so you all, I didn't tell you what was going on in that. You recognize that this is the actor, Matt Smith, okay? And there's a clue in the background that he's on his, his Doctor Who set. And you know that actors have tea breaks and they carry with them scripts. And so you've filled in all the details. Right? You got there. Okay, what does the state-of-the-art machine learning program make of this? It recognizes Matt Smith. And what do I mean by recognize Matt Smith? It produces the text, Matt Smith, when it sees that picture. But all of the rest of that, that you have and you are easily able to do, the state-of-the-art machine learning programs can't do. Right? Why? Because you've got common sense experience of the world. You know about actors and tea breaks and scripts 
Uh, and once you recognize Matt Smith and you know that he played Doctor Who, right, and that he's an actor, that meant that the thing that was in his pocket was probably a script, and you could tell me a big, long story about what's going on around that. And current machine learning programs are impressive because they can produce the text Matt Smith. They recognize that face, and they produce that text Matt Smith. All the rest of it, at the moment, we don't have any clue how to give to computers. Okay, uh, I'm running out of time, so let me say you've set the scene for AI at Oxford in the last few words. Okay, so the Vice Chancellor at the beginning talked about Oxford as being a powerhouse of AI. That was not just hyperbole. Right now, Oxford is the most remarkable place, certainly in Europe, to do AI research and development. Uh, let me just put some substance on that. So the first thing is, our AI activity, the core AI science and technology, is not just limited to one department. We've got three key departments. There's my own computer science, we've got information engineering, which is where Oxprotica came from, uh, and you'll, you'll hear more about them, and then we've got statistics. So in the computer science department, we look at the algorithmic foundations of all of this stuff. How can we do things efficiently? We look at reasoning and problem solving techniques, reinforcement learning, the semantic web building around Tim Berners-Lee, uh, who's, on our, our, who's a member of staff here, human-centered AI, multi-agent AI, my own work, AI in the environment. And then we've got statistics, we've got the statistical foundations of AI, the theory of deep learning, health applications, and very much more besides. In information engineering, they, they focus on computer vision, robotics, autonomous systems, driverless cars, AI in healthcare, planning, AI in science and finance, for Bayesian reasoning. So we've got these three departments, all of which internationally are world leaders in artificial intelligence, all doing remarkable things in the foundations of AI. And then around that, in the Oxford AI ecosystem, we've got a huge range of users of these technologies and people who are thinking about the governance of these technologies. So here in the business school, in law, materials, oncology, biomedical and clinical sciences, mass physics, chemistry, they are all queuing up to use AI and machine learning techniques. Being powered by, at that hub, these three core departments, the Oxford Internet Institute, the philosophy department doing ethical foundations of AI uh, and issues of existential risk. And then underpinning that, we've got Oxford Science and Innovation, which are driving unprecedented, unprecedented wave of startup activity. So here are just a few from departments that I know about. Here are a few of our AI spin-off companies. So Oxprotica, as the Vice Chancellor mentioned, Mind Foundry, they have one of the one of the supporters of this, Dark Blue Labs, acquired by DeepMind, uh, Navinio, machine learning based indoor localization, Ultronics, amazing work in uh, cardiology, Morpheus Labs, machine learning for modeling autonomous vehicles, and many others besides. It is unprecedented. Right now, there is nowhere else in Europe that has that combination of the core science and technology, the wider ecosystem, and the spin-off culture. There's nowhere else like it in Europe. Okay, just to really wrap up, one final slide. If you, in your likely event at this point, you really are worried about our um, robots taking over, this is an entirely genuine video from 2015, puts a couple of years out of date, from a competition organized by the US military which was about dexterity in robots. And they have a task to carry out, which is in this case, <laughs> opening a door or not opening a door. So if you really are still worried about our robot overlords taking over, then my advice to you is to close the door. Uh, you don't need to lock it, just close it, and I think you'll be safe. Thank you. <laughs>